good encouraging songs. I appreciate that, uh, Spencer. Uh, we certainly have a knack, young, young men who are leading the singing. They, they have an excellent ch choice of, of songs to sing as we consider that uh, we encourage one another uh, and to spur one another on to uh, continue walking, re remain faithful in our Lord. This evening, as I mentioned earlier this morning, this evening, the Holy Spirit and the miraculous is our topic for tonight. Uh, launching point for our, our text would be Acts chapter 2, in which you'll recognize this as, well, the day of Pentecost is often referred to. Acts chapter 2 is the hub of the Bible. It's the turning pivotal point of the kingdom of God. The whole God, God's plan is to save mankind pivots around this one event. In fact, so many prophecies from the Old Testament are directed at this one day, one time, one moment in time when the kingdom was launched, when it was established. And it was under miraculous conditions and under, that, that it occurred. If we, if we turn to Acts chapter 2, and verse 1, you'll recognize this right off. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, and they were all with one accord in one place. Now, they were talking about, there was the, 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 uh, the 120 of them that were gathered together, that were, that were uh, believers, and they were all gathered together in one place. The day of Pentecost is a special feast that the, the Jews required to go to Jerusalem to observe this feast. You know, it's interesting that of all the, we consider that in this day and age, the Christian age, what are we required to do? What, are, what does God require us to do? And we look at those things to walk in the light. Is even, he is even in the light. And the, and, the, and the things are required to assemble together on the first day of each week to partake of the Lord's Supper to, and all the, the avenues or the acts of worship that we do. But we're not required to go leave our homes and travel to some far distant city and, and join together with a multitude of other Christians and observe some special feast. But this was something that was under the Mosaic Law that the, the, they were required. And so when we look at the, the, the verses in chapter 2, we see there are some 15 different nations that were enumerated from which the, the, the Jews of that day had come to gather from, from into Jerusalem. So there are 15 different nations. And of all those, they had their different uh, languages, the different dialects. So as we read this, it makes significance as to that not only was the prophesying of the old day of the day this, that God would establish a kingdom um, in, uh, that all the people come from around the world. And so it was. They literally came from all over the world, all over the Roman Empire, all even and beyond the realms of the Roman Empire. So as we see the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Now we, we look at this, and it, it seems apparent that these cloven tongues was the manifestation of the Holy Spirit, these manifest, that is the cloven tongues of fire, were, were the Holy Spirit... Uh, uh, in their baptism of that. We'll discuss that in a moment, why this is. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues, other languages, as the Spirit gave them utterance. So the Holy Spirit inspired these, these, it, the, uh, the apostles, the, the miracle that was occurring was upon the apostles as they began to speak and glorify God. Now, we, when we go back to Act, uh, Acts chapter 1, when Christ is telling them to stay in the city, until they be endued with power. He's talking about uh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Like I said, we'll, we'll discuss this more in a moment. So as we look at the text verses, it, re it reveals such an overwhelming manifestation and presence of the Holy Spirit. And his play uh, was a very important role in the fulfillment of, of Joel's prophecy. And that's what uh, actually Peter discusses much, that what these men were perceiving as they were questioning what meaneth all this, Peter described this as the fulfillment of Joel's prophecy, as this was all related to the establishment of God's promised kingdom. We can turn to Daniel chapter 2, verse 44, Isaiah 2, verses 2 through 4, and Joel 2, verses 28 through 30, and see all these things coming together in one place at one time to fulfill the prophecies of the kingdom. So just as those who witnessed this phenomenal event were confused as to its meaning, so too are people today confused. And particularly I mean that is who is the Holy Spirit? Or what is the Holy Spirit, some will ask. And what, what are the ideas that people have regarding 
the Holy Spirit. Okay? Uh, and so what was the significance of the Holy Spirit's presence and his role, particularly on this day of Pentecost and even today? So because of this confusion that evolves around the, the misunderstandings of the Holy Spirit, who he is and what his role is, and you'll notice I'm using the masculine pronoun for this because it is, is, is I think, is an appropriate uh, reference, pronoun to refer to the Holy Spirit. Um, so what was the significance of his role? And so many extreme positions and assertions are made without actually studying all the evidence which the Bible presents to us regarding the Holy Spirit. Okay. Um, so there, if we consider some characteristics which the Bible reveals about him, and I use the pro masculine pronoun for him, the Spirit knows, and, and there's, there's a reason I use this word, the Spirit knows, okay, 1 Corinthians 2.10, but God hath revealed him unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man, but the Spirit of God. So the Spirit of God knows the things of God. Just as our spirit knows the things about ourselves, so the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, knows things of God. The Spirit knows. Here's, here's the point. The Spirit knows. Okay, The Spirit has thoughts. The Spirit has understanding. And, and the import of that is simply that it's not some vague influence or uh, concept abstract concept, the Holy Spirit is a person. Let's consider another reference to the, the Spirit. The Holy Spirit speaks. Acts 13, 2, as they ministered to the Lord and fastened the Holy Ghost, said, separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work unto where I have called them. The Holy Spirit said, the speaking to them, that they should separate Paul and Barnabas for the purpose of going to the Gentiles. Now, this is not a, a, a mere influence. This is a, a, a person who's speaking, who's knowing, and who's speaking. Also, Acts 21.11. Um, and when he was coming to us, he took Paul's girdle. Now, this is the prophet who was, who was uh, going to give a very important message to Paul. So he took his girdle and bound his own hands and feet and said, Thus saith the Holy Ghost. Thus saith the Holy Ghost. So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man that owneth his girdle and shall deliver him unto the hands of the Gentiles. He was warning Paul that if he went down to Jerusalem, he's going to be put in bonds by the Jews. Well, Paul said, come on, I'm ready. He went down. It, it was not going to dissuade him from going down to Jerusalem. But the point being that this prophet who spoke, who had illustrated this bond, binding, put his hands in bind, bonds, was, he, it was because what the Holy Spirit said. Also consider Acts 28, 25. And when they agreed not among themselves, they departed. After that, Paul had spoken one word. Well spake the Holy Ghost by Isaiah, the prophet unto our fathers. So, so the idea that, that as uh, the prophets had revealed the, the word of God through inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and so as Paul made reference to this, well spake the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost had spoken words. Okay, and 1 Timothy 4, 1, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, or doctrines of demon, as, as the American Standard renders it. Now think about... Uh, as the Spirit speaks expressly, okay, so, so Paul was revealing to Timothy what the Holy Spirit had told him. And, you know, often we think about what is inspiration? How did these, these uh, writers receive their inspiration? How did the Holy Spirit communicate? And usually we think about inspiration, well, they get this feeling, I've got to write this down. Okay, and they're, they're motivated, and they're, they're extremely motivated, so they, they write it down, or it comes quietly in a whisper in the voice. But here we see the Spirit speaks expressly. That sounds like there is a, a physical presence, and we know that, that God is spirit. I'm not saying that, but as, as, as God has manifested himself, as, as the angels have manifested themselves in the physical, uh, uh, as physical beings. So it was that, that Paul had received words, the spirit speak, spoke expressly, particularly, specifically about the, in the latter times. So, so the Holy Spirit knows, it thinks, he thinks, the Holy Spirit speaks as any uh, uh, knowing being would speak. Okay. And also the Holy Spirit has emotions. The Holy Spirit has emotions. Ephesians 4.30 And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed into the day of redemption. Grieve not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit can be grieved. The Holy Spirit has grief. 
Okay. Now, now, as we looked at these few verses here to indicate that the Holy Spirit is not some enigmatic, abstract concept. It's a per the Holy Spirit is a person, not some nebulous, abstract concept or influence. Okay? The Holy Spirit is a person, just like the Father is a person. And the, and the Son, before he became the Son, he was the Word. They were, he was, uh, he is a person. And so we think of the three divine persons. We think of the Trinity, the, the God in three persons. Uh, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And, and we recognize the Father certainly as an individual. He's the designer. If you look at the, the Genesis account of creation, he said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Genesis 1, 26. To whom was he speaking? He said, God spoke. Now, to whom is he speaking? He, God was speaking among himself. He wasn't talking to himself individually, but rather he was speaking amongst the, the two other members of the Godhead. We can go to... to uh, so as we look at this, so the us being the other members of the Godhead and deciding and making that, that uh, uh, decision to make man and to make him in his own, own image, what, role about, what about the others? We know that the Son, the, the only begotten Son in the form of Jesus Christ, what was he before? You know, we understand that Jesus is, is not a mere man. Jesus is God. I think that's when we, we make our good confession of Jesus Christ. We are confessing that we believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. We're confessing that he's divine. He's divine. He's not like we are sons of God, but he is divine and unique. As we consider John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Now note, all things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. So the, Jesus, our Savior, before he was incarnated in the, his physical body, was the Word, that relationship with the Father, which was, is very unique, and that he was instrumental in the creation of all things as well. Colossians 1.16, For by him, speaking of Jesus Christ, were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. So as Jesus, when he was the word, was involved with the creation, not only the physical creation, the stars, the planets, the moon, the, our, our earth, everything there, but also in the establishment of authorities. And as, he, as it is referencing here, the, the thrones, dominions, and principalities or powers were not all those here on earth. They are the heavenly realm. So Jesus, when he was the word, was involved with the establishment of, of authorities in the heavenly realm. In Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1, God, who at sundry times and diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. So it's just all these passages referring to Christ involved in the creation of all things. And, and so we see that the, the second member of the Godhead. But what about the third member, the Holy Spirit? What was his work in the creation? As we look at some passages in Genesis 1-2, And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Okay. So the Spirit was involved with the, with the very beginning in the creation of things. As we look at Job 26-13, by his spirit he hath garnished the heavens. His hand hath formed the crooked serpent. So the Holy Spirit involved with the garnishing of the heavens, the beautifying of the heavens. Uh, the Holy Spirit is the finisher and the beautifier. He is the one who brought order out of chaos. He's the one who made the world a habitable place. So as we look at the different, different roles of different members of the Godhead, where you have the Father who is making the, the I guess you might say, the executive decisions. And it's the Son who is executing those decisions, and the Holy Spirit who is finishing up the work. Different roles, just like we might think of the, the architect, the uh, contractor, and the, the, the actual uh, uh, skills, uh, skilled workers in, in, the, in building up a home or any, any great edifice. So those are some things about the Holy Spirit that, that puts us into consideration, who is the Holy Spirit? Well, he's God. He's a real person in the sense of, 
an individual, a member of the Godhead, sharing all the divine nature, all the character, divine characteristics, uh, characteristics of God. And, uh, and, of course, we know his work was not merely in creation as well, but also in our obtaining and, and having uh, contact with or having this, the Bible, his, God's word in our hands. Not only inspiring men, we, we've read about that in uh, uh, Hebrews 1. We've also, we'll look at another passage in Second Peter right now, the Old Testament prophets. Look at, consider the Old Testament, Testament prophets were not baptized in the Holy Spirit. As we consider the baptism in the Holy Spirit, particularly now in our uh, uh, short study of the Holy Spirit, in 2 Peter 1.21, talking about the scriptures and particularly about the prophets, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. They were, uh, they were think about a, a wave and coming in from the ocean, you know, uh, if you've ever been to the, been to the beach and, and run out to the, into the water, you could actually, those, those waves coming in, you can actually take off, take, start swimming and, and uh, catch a wave to, to, to ride all the way up to the shore, okay? Or if you happen to be into surfing, you can, you can catch a wave on a surfboard as well. Born along by that wave. So it was these, these prophets who were being born away, or born along by the Holy Spirit, being moved to write the Word of God. Um, now, the baptism of the Holy Spirit was first mentioned in Matthew 3.11. So that the point of this is that uh, the, these prophets were not baptized by or in the Holy Spirit. But the, only, the first reference of this is in Matthew 3.11. When John the baptizer, he said, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Two different baptisms altogether. The Holy Spirit, of course, we've read about already in Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit, uh, that the, the apostles were baptized in or by the Holy Spirit. Uh, they were immersed into the Holy Spirit, and the, the, we'll look at the results of that in a moment. But the baptism of fire is not something we want or desire for ourselves. Baptism of fire is condemnation. It is eternal damnation in, in, the, the, uh, in the lake of fire. Okay, everlasting torment. But as we th think, Jesus received the Spirit without measure. As John 3.34 makes the point, For he whom God has sent speaketh the words of God. For God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. So Jesus Christ, having received the Holy Spirit without measure. And what's the point of this? Well, in all the aspects of the abilities that, that uh, we see that Jesus had the ability, he performed miracles, he could see the hearts of men, um, and we know about the, the, the feeding of the 5,000 with just a few loaves and, and fishes, right? So Jesus had um, a unlimited or measure of the Holy Spirit. But in that statement, it implies that anyone else that had been received the Spirit had received it in measure, okay? Not the fullness of the Holy Spirit, but rather it, with measure. The fact that this was said... Uh, implies that. So the Old Testament prophets received that measure which enabled them to, to be God's spokesman. You know, a prophet is one who speaks for another. Particularly as we look at Exodus chapter 7 verse 1, remember when God was, was calling Moses, commissioning him to go back to Egypt to talk to Pharaoh and demand that Pharaoh let God's people go, release them. And as, as Moses was offering God up reasons why he could not, some would say he's giving excuses why he didn't want to go. But as it was, Lord, God was supplying everything that Moses would need to fulfill this, this purpose. And in Exodus 7, verse 1, And the Lord said unto Moses, See, I have made thee a god to Pharaoh. That would be a judge to Pharaoh. And Aaron thy brother shall be thy prophet. So we see the use of the term prophet was that Aaron was, was Moses' spokesperson. Aaron would speak, whereas Moses thought he did not have the eloquence required, eloquence required to speak to the prophet in, such a, you know, in the king's court. So God gave him Aaron to be his, his prophet. So as we think of God's prophets are those who speak on behalf of God. You know, some had the additional measure, some of the prophets had the additional measure which enabled them to work miracles. We, th we think about uh, raising some from the dead. Um, but after Christ was resurrected, he, he made reference to the baptism in the spirit, which John the Baptist had mentioned. Remember, John, that the baptizer had said, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost. 
But we see in Acts chapter 1, verse 4, as he's talking to his disciples just before he ascends to heaven, he says, And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. Remember back at the, uh, the, that just a few days prior, the, on the Last Supper, when, God, when Jesus was speaking to his disciples, and he promised them he would send the comforter. When he ascended into heaven, he would send the comforter, which was the spirit of truth, which is the Holy Spirit. And he, he clarified for them the purpose of this and what the Holy Spirit would do for them. But so as he's now making reference to them, he's talking about that they should remain in the city until they be endued with power. Uh, uh, that is, but the way for the promise of the Father which saith, he have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost, not many days hence. The promise of the Holy Spirit baptizing them in water. Now, this was unique. This had never happened before. Never happened before what was about to happen. The disciples were to wait in Jerusalem until they had been baptized in the Holy Spirit. That's exactly what happened on the day of Pentecost following Jesus' ascension. In Acts 2, verses 1 through 4, which we read earlier, describes events which took place on that day. So what do you think? What is the baptism of the Holy Spirit? How is that different? How is that unique? Well, if we consider what actually happened, nowhere else in the Bible except we'll, we'll look at also in Acts chapter 10 that it occurred. The results of this Holy Spirit baptism was that the recipients could speak in tongues, other languages. Um, in Acts 2 verse 4, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues and the Spirit gave them utterance. So the Holy Spirit inspired them to speak, not only speak the words, but the words in the other languages which they didn't speak themselves. Okay. So this was one of the, the results where they would speak in tongues. But more than that, more than that, they also had inspiration. And as I made reference to John 14, verse 26, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Later on, he, the Holy Spirit would guide them unto all truth. So the Holy Spirit would provide them inspiration, not only for what they would say in their teaching and their preaching, but also what they would write if they were writing epistles and it was known to be uh, 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 inspired writings that to be used as canon. Okay. So, um, and it was unique because if you look at all the things they're able to do in speaking in tongues, having the inspiration, but also uh, ultimately the ability, uh, the ability to lay their hands upon others and they would receive a measure of the Holy Spirit. See, these apostles, when the Holy, they were baptized in the Holy Spirit, received all the gifts apparently. Okay. Um, so we consider the baptism of the Spirit. What did the, Spirit, the baptism of the Spirit not do? The baptism of the Spirit had specific purpose. It was intended so that the, it would be a sign to everyone that the message was preached was from God and that they themselves were the messengers from God. The fact that they could perform these miracles, it was, it was an indication that to those that, that, would, that would hear and witness the, what they would do would say, surely these are from God. But the baptism of the Holy Spirit did not do some things that are very important. The baptism of the Spirit did not depend on human agency. It was ministered by the Lord, Acts 1, verse 5. Remember, it was the Lord who sent them. It was the Lord who sent the Holy Spirit. Um, and and, and uh, it was by the Lord's authority that those apostles were baptized in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit did not purify the heart. What purifies the heart? Acts 15, 9. And put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. What purified their hearts in Acts 15, 9? It was their faith. The Holy Spirit did not do that for them. Okay. Uh, the Holy Spirit did not sanctify. John 17, 17. Jesus in the Lord's prayer, in his prayer to the Father, the night of his betrayal, in the Garden of Gethsemane, said, I prayed, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So how is one sanctified? How is one set apart? God's word of truth. And so the Holy Spirit doesn't do that for us. That's a work of, the, of God's word. Now we know the Holy Spirit provides us God's word, yes. But the Holy Spirit himself does not sanctify us. It's our understanding the word and applying it that we are sanctified. The 
Holy Spirit does not save. Holy Spirit doesn't save. What does save? Acts eleven fourteen. Who shall tell thee words? Speaking of the Holy Spirit, will tell them words whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved. Rather, I should say it was it was Cornelius who was being told of the things that uh, they would that uh, uh, they would hear words whereby they would be saved. That's what the gospel is. They are the words that lead us unto salvation. They are the words that when we adhere to them, abide by them, we'll be saved. You make a wise, uh, wives and salvation. They don't convert. As we consider Psalms 19.7, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony, testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. So it's the law of the Lord that makes one perfect. It's the law of the world that converts the soul. Uh, it's the law of the Lord that whereby we walk that uh, we may be found uh, in walking in the Lord. And the, the uh, Holy Spirit did not give faith. We know that there are gifts of the Holy Spirit, one of which is faith, supernatural faith. But the Holy Spirit himself did not give faith. In Acts 14, 1, And it came to pass in Iconium that they went both together into the synagogue of the Jews, and, to, and so spake that a great multitude, both of the Jews and also the Greeks, believed. So what is it that caused their faith? It was the words that were spoken. Yes, the Holy Spirit did inspire those words, but the Holy Spirit himself did not miraculously save them. It did not miraculously give them faith. It did not miraculously convert them. Okay, All these things that the, whole, the Holy Spirit converts us, but not by direct operation. Manipulating us is another way we might say it. God doesn't manipulate us in the sense of, of, of uh, strong-arming us. Okay? He presents us the facts, and he appeals to our intellect so that we say, yea, verily, this is the truth, and believe and follow after what we must do to find salvation. And the baptism of the Holy Spirit was a very unusual event. In fact, I will, I will say it is in Acts chapter 2 was, was unique. And we'll discuss in a moment Acts chapter 10. It was also unique. So, so it was not common, as we consider in Acts 11, verse 15, beginning, Peter was giving account what happened in Cornelius' house. You recall in Acts chapter 10 when, when uh, uh, the Holy Spirit or an angel had given Cornelius the command to go, go send for Peter, and they sent for Peter, and the Holy Spirit had given Peter visions of, of a sheep being let down with all sorts of manner of meats, animals, clean and unclean, and was told to go and eat. And the, the point being is, call not thou common that which God has, has uh, called clean. Okay? And so Peter knew something was up. This vision was so unused to him. And so when he immediately, after the vision, there was one knocking on the door requesting that he come to the house of Cornelius. Certainly this was unusual. So he went and, and he went and he spoke to Cornelius and recognized that, that this was special and that the Holy Spirit had sent him to go talk to the house, a, a Gentile. Up to this point, the Jews had only been uh, uh, received the gospel. Only they had been given audience to the gospel. But at this point, Cornelius, the Gentile, was given. And there was a very unique event now that declared that God was behind this. Okay? And that was the baptism of the Holy Spirit. This was the second time this occurred, but it is different in a little bit. I'll just, I'll just say that in a moment. Acts 11.15, as Peter was recounting it, and as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them as on us at the beginning. What beginning? The beginning of the kingdom. The day of Pentecost. Remember when the Holy Spirit baptized the apostles. And so the events that took place, they were speaking in tongues. And, and they were praising God. The same thing happened. And Peter recognized this as just like on us at the beginning. Then remembered I the word of the Lord, how that he said, John indeed baptized with water but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. For as much then as God gave them the like gift as he did unto us, who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, what was I that I could withstand God? When, I, they, when they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. They recognize this as a message from God, the approval and opening up of the, of the Gentile world to the gospel, to salvation. And this was very important. 
just as the Holy Spirit uh, brought in the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, that one that prophesied, and it was not mistaken for the events. It was spectacular. It was miraculous. And the Holy Spirit was there baptizing those uh, 11 or 12 apostles. And here on the, in, at, in Acts chapter 10, Cornelius' house, the same thing. The Holy Spirit is announcing and proclaiming, giving his, his uh, signs that this is from God. And God intended to save Gentiles too. It was a sign for the unbeliever. I could talk a lot about the, 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 the gift of tongues and the tongues that are used as a sign to the non-believer, but we see that in Acts chapter 2, where they're speaking in tongues, it was a sign for the non-believer that those who didn't believe in, in Jesus Christ as the Son of God, or that uh, it caused them to believe. And in the day of Cornelius, when, they, when Peter went to, talk to, to speak to Cornelius' household, it was the, that they were speaking in tongues was a sign to the non-believing Jews. That up to this point, they had thought that salvation was only for the Jews. They didn't believe it was for the Gentiles. But this was a sign that, yea, verily, salvation is for the Gentiles, too. So these are the two only events that we can reference in the Bible where they were baptized by the Holy Spirit, immersed into the Holy Spirit. That's what baptism is. It's unfortunate that that word baptism was not translated. It was merely transliterated. So instead of the, the Greek term baptizo, which means to immerse, was transliterated, or we would, is anglicized, we might say, baptized. And instead of translated, which we would say immersed, it would have solved so many problems if we had, they had just translated that word. Even today they can do it, but they won't. They won't translate that word. It's become such a common usage now, and there's such a, uh, an immense amount of false doctrine regarding baptism that if they actually translated it, it would, it would, it would uh, uh, reveal the error of, of many of the different doctrines that are about baptism. Okay. So as we consider the gifts of the Spirit, they did receive the gifts. And you, we can look in Acts chapter 9, when, when, or Acts chapter 8, I should say, when Philip went down to Samaria and converted many of the Samaritans. Very prolific in his speaking of the, the Word of God. Many believers, but... And Philip could perform miracles. He proved he was from God by performing those miracles. But one thing he couldn't do was pass on the, the power of the, the miraculous manifestations of the Holy Spirit. They called for apostles to come down. Peter and John came down, and they laid hands upon those Christians. And they imparted them to them gifts. And they were, they were measures of the Holy Spirit. They were gifts. And we know that the purpose and the duration of the miracles is... is uh, as we look at Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 11, we can see some of the gifts enumerated. And he gave some apostles, and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. But in it, he also says the purpose is, in verse 12, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. That's the purpose of the gifts. We don't have those gifts now, but we do have the word of God that edifies us. It, it causes us to grow in the spirit as we mature from a babe in Christ to a mature adult in Christ, come to the full stature of, of Jesus Christ. But when will all this end? When, were there, when was, it, was it intended that all of those, those miraculous manifestations would end? In verse 13, Ephesians. Till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, that is a full-grown man, a mature man, a, a full-grown body, creature, the church being the body, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. So the purpose of them is that they would cause the church to grow, help them to grow, they mature in the, the, the knowledge of the doctrine of Christ so that they wouldn't be tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. They wouldn't be drawn away and manipulated by smooth talkers and, and, and uh, guys uh, in, uh, pressing in their own doctrines and teachings, that they would know, identify false doctrine. And that was the purpose, and that came when? Until they all come to unity to faith. Did they ever? Yes, they did. Paul writes a lot about 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 
and in Galatians chapter 1, in the whole, in most of the book of Galatians, talking about the false teachers, the Judaizing teachers. Did they come to unity? Yes, unity was found in the, everything they taught, and no apostle taught anything differently. And the preachers that went about, they didn't teach anything differently. There were the false, there were the false teachers that entered in, yes, but that they, they identified them by name. And, and so the purpose and the, the, the uh, duration until they all come to the unity of faith and knowledge of the Son of God. And when that came, the need for the gifts would not be necessary. Uh, we can look at uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 31. Paul is particularly discussing the supernatural, miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit. But in that middle of that discussion, he says, but covet earnestly the best gifts. And yet show I unto you a more excellent way. So there was something better than what the gifts of the Spirit offered. Yes, the gifts of the Spirit offered them much in their confirmation and their ability to dis discern the false teacher and things like that. But there was still a better way. And we know about that. The great chapter of love, chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians. As, he, as in, in verse 8, to summarize what he had already been talking about, charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. So he says, particularly, when that system comes that is perfect, that our current system, which is only in part, will be done away. Part in what way? What way? They knew in part. Why? Because their knowledge came only in parts. And the prophecies of speaking from the Holy Spirit came only in parts. It was not complete. But when it was complete, perfect, mature, then that incomplete system, that impartial, in part system, we've done away, replaced by that perfect system in their gaining and attaining knowledge of our Lord and Savior of the doctrine of Christ. So the Holy Spirit is God, just like the Father and Jesus are God. Jesus had promised that he would send the Comforter in John 14, 16. In verse 17, he says, Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. And that was pr promise was to the apostles. Note that the Comforter, or the Holy Spirit, was promised to the 11 apostles, not to every Christian, nor to those who would, with their own eyes, witness the miracles. As those witnessed the miracles, the Holy Spirit was not promised to them. When they preached the gospel, they didn't preach, and you will have these wonderful, magnificent gifts. Yes, that's not what saved their soul. They did receive them through the laying on of the apostles' hands, but that was not the import. That was not what was most important. You know, we do not deny the imminence of, nor the power of, nor the fact that the Holy Spirit is not sleeping. We don't deny that the Holy Spirit is active. We don't, we don't put him in a little box and say, he's, he's done his work already and that's all he does. You know, God is God. And, and the Holy Spirit will continue to do what he does regardless of our correct or incorrect understanding of his activities. God, the Holy Spirit will do what he does regardless of our understanding of him. And, and, and to put the Holy Spirit in a little box and, as, the, as though he were a little servant, I think that's a mistake. We have to understand that just as the Father is God, just as our Savior Jesus Christ, the preeminent one, is God, so too is the Holy Spirit. But we need to steer clear of, of any ideas of what the Holy Spirit is not and, and what we should expect from the Holy Spirit because that will distract us because the import is not the wonderful powers that are found that were found in the Old Testament when they were proving that, that what they spoke was the word of God. But the important thing is our finding salvation. Our important thing is that we find forgiveness of sins. It's the saving of our soul. That's the important thing. And that we find forgiveness of sins through our obedience to the gospel, the obedience to the commands that are given us. You know, we know we must believe in God. We know we must, because the, Hebrew, the Hebrews writer wrote in Hebrews 11:6, 6, uh, for without faith it is an impossible to be well-pleasing to him, for we must first believe that he is, 
and that he's a rewarder then that seek after him or diligently seek him. So we must have faith. That's essential. That is, interestingly enough, faith is a command. <laughs> faith is a command. And then we, we know that we must confess Jesus Christ. And what, you know, we talk about the good confession. What is that? You know, we, we confess our sins. Yes, we confess our sins to the Father as we seek our forgiveness. And that is associated with our repentance. But as we think about the good confession, that's talking about confessing Jesus Christ what our faith in him was, that he's the son of God. For whosoever therefore will confess me before men, him will I confess before my Father, which is in heaven. But whosoever will deny me before men, him will I deny before my Father, which is in heaven. Matthew 10, 32 and 33. So we must confess Jesus Christ as the son of God to identify ourselves as Christians, disciples of Christ. To identify ourselves, we are following him. And we believe that he is God the Son of God. And I mentioned about our, our confession of our sins. We confess, yes, indeed, we have sinned. That's part of our repentance. As We can't repent of something we don't proclaim we have. Okay. Yeah, I'll, re I'll repent of sins, but I really don't have any sins. I'm not guilty. You know, that's, that's a lie. We have, to, we have to own up, fess up. We have to own up to our sins. Say, yes, I have sinned. And they are what condemn me. And so because of that, I'm going to turn away from them. I'm going to repent. Not only do I have remorse having hurt God and destroyed my relationship with him, separating myself from him, but I'm going to turn away from that. I'm going to stop doing what separated me from God to begin with. And I make that relationship right. Repentance of sins. Jesus told his disciples, I tell you, nay, except ye repent, ye shall in like manner perish. Luke 13, 3. And as Peter had proclaimed, and all the other apostles, and all the great pre preachers, any preacher who preaches the gospel will proclaim this. As Peter proclaimed, when asked, men and brethren, what must we do? On that day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit gave him utterance, he was inspired by the Holy Spirit, he said, when, he, when they asked him, what must we do? He said, repent ye, and be baptized, every one of you. In the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Acts 2.38. Everlasting life is given them. It's a gift of God. As we know from Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is everlasting life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's the gift of God. That's what, what uh, uh, the Holy Spirit, God, gives us. When we, out of, from our faith, are motivated by our faith to obey him, submit ourselves to him in, in these, this, these works of obedience, just like Abraham believed God, therefore he obeyed him, his works wrought his faith, his works revealed, manifested his faith. So it is as Christ, those who appeal to God for forgiveness of sins manifest their faith in obedience to being baptized for the remission of sins. As Peter declared the, that, that baptism is not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but is the answer of a good conscience toward God. It's baptism that saves us. Not baptism alone, but without it, we can't be saved. Just like without faith, we can't be saved. Without repentance, we can't be saved. Without confessing Jesus Christ as the Son of God, we can't be saved. And without walking faithfully, having renounced our sins and turned away from them, be resolved not to commit those sins again. One cannot have salvation until he turns away from his sins. So if you would respond and obey the gospel tonight to find forgiveness of sins, appealing to God for forgiveness of sins out of a good conscience, then come forward as we stand and as we sing.